Good afternoon. Welcome, and thank you for joining our Obstruction of Justice briefing. I'm Kristen Ammerling, and this event is sponsored by a project I'm coordinating for the American Constitution Society and Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington called the Presidential Investigation Education Project. We are grateful to Senator Whitehouse and his staff for graciously hosting us in this lovely meeting room. And we are glad that the Senator is planning to join the event a little later on to share his perspective. I want to start with a few brief thoughts um, about the joint ACS crew project and the program today. And then I'll turn things over to our moderator to kick off the discussion. The Presidential Investigation Education Project is a joint nonpartisan initiative of the American Constitution Society and Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington to promote informed public evaluation of the investigation by Special Counsel Robert Mueller into Russian interference in the 2016 election and related congressional inquiries. We do this by developing and disseminating analysis of key legal issues that are emerging in the investigations, by connecting interested members of the public, press, and policymakers to the extensive network of legal scholars and experts associated with CRU and ACS, and by holding events like today's briefing. We are driven by a view that the issues at stake in these inquiries are serious and have potential consequences, and by an awareness that developments are resulting in legal questions that at times are very complex. We want to promote thoughtful, thorough public consideration of these issues uh, that is grounded in legal and constitutional analysis amid the the challenge that we all face of the hectic and high volume news cycles. So toward this goal, today's event focuses on obstruction of justice. We have convened a very distinguished panel of constitutional and criminal law experts. And um, we are focusing on this topic because obstruction of justice is an area of law that is in the scope of the inquiry by Robert Mueller, um, as set forth in the order appointing him. And since that appointment, there have been multiple reports suggesting that he may be looking at obstruction issues. So the panel today will examine a variety of legal questions relating to obstruction of justice law and precedent. Um, we will also have some time at the end for audience questions. And one housekeeping note, um, for those of you in the audience who are interested in getting a CLE credit for this event, it qualifies for 1.5 hours, and you can sign up outside the door of this room. So with that, um, I hope you enjoy the event, and I will introduce our moderator, who will then give some additional background about our distinguished panel and kick off the discussion. We are very fortunate to have Kimberly Atkins facilitating the conversation today. She has background both in law and journalism and currently covers the White House, um, uh, Supreme Court, and Congress for the Boston Herald. And in addition, is a guest host on C-SPAN's Washington Journal and is a contributor with MSNBC. Um, we know that she is skilled at fostering uh, lively and informative discussion, and I will turn it over to her to get that started. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you all for joining us today for this very uh, timely discussion about obstruction of justice. Uh, I, it, I have the pleasure to introduce our very esteemed panel for this discussion. I'll keep the uh, introduction brief. You'll have you have their full bios in your materials for your review. Uh, we have Ambassador Norman Eisen. He is uh, chairman of the Board of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics, which, uh, as we said, is a, a co-host of this 
this event. Uh, he's also a co-founder of Crew, and he previously served as the chief ethics lawyer for President Obama. Uh, and in that role, he was dubbed Mr. No uh, for his uh, tough compliance program uh, that he implemented at the White House. He's also served as ambassador to the Czech Republic, and since 2014 has been a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution. Across the way, we have Barbara L. McQuaid. She's a professor from practice at the University of Michigan Law School. She served as the US Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, the first woman to serve in that post. And uh, as a US Attorney, she oversaw cases involving public corruption, uh, as well as other areas of law. And bec before becoming a US Attorney, uh, she served as an Assistant US Attorney in Detroit, my hometown, for 12 years. Um, Jed Sugarman teaches uh, at Fordham Law School and is the author of The People's Courts, Pursuing Judicial Independence in America. Uh, and he, uh, he is currently working on an anti-corruption emoluments litigation against the Trump administration. He's also writing about American prosecutors and the design of the federal executive. And he writes about law and politics on the blog sugarblog.com. Uh, we, as uh, Kristen said, we also expect to be joined uh, by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island a little bit later on. Uh, and when he comes, obviously, we will get him uh, right up so that he can, uh, he can address you and hopefully take some of your questions as well. We know you will have questions during this discussion, fear not. We will have time at the end of the program to take your questions, so just hold on to them and uh, know that we will get to that. So I wanna kick off this discussion just talking about some of the key federal uh, obstruction and justice laws that are in place, sort of setting up the legal landscape, uh, how, it, it, how it exists as we begin this discussion, and I wanna start with Norm. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kim, and thanks uh, everybody uh, for uh, joining us today. Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, representing Crew uh, as part of this uh, presidential investigation project that we do together with, with ACS. Uh, the, I, I must say, oh, and by the way, I've received a promotion. I'm a senior fellow at Brookings now. They must like troublemaking over there. Uh, the, I must say that in my uh, career, which began with uh, 20 years of uh, law practice uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, principally as a criminal defense lawyer, I never imagined that I would see the day uh, when uh, the uh, most uh, uh, pressing uh, public question uh, was the elements of an obstruction of justice claim and whether the separation of powers prohibits uh, obstruction uh, uh, proceedings against the sitting president of the United States. Whatever downsides there are to the era of Trump, uh, it has made law students of all of us, uh, students of American law of the world. So uh, that is uh, that is a silver lining. Uh, the um, the crime of uh, obstruction of justice uh, is one uh, in Anglo-American law, and of course we trace our roots, and Kim, how long do you want me to go for, I should Five ask? Minutes. Five minutes, yeah. okay. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's one that is uh, as old as the idea of justice itself, because of course, as soon as you have a notion uh, that individuals are gonna be held accountable uh, to the law, uh, you have efforts to evade that accountability. And while there are a, a variety of obstruction of justice statutes, uh, each of which has their own distinct elements, uh, and the case law is intricate, uh, outside on the table, uh, uh, there are copies of our uh, Brookings uh, report on presidential obstruction of justice, which I did with myself as a former 
defense lawyer with our crew, executive director Noah Bookbinder, who is a former prosecutor, and Barry Burke, a very distinguished, currently practicing criminal defense lawyer in New York. Uh, the report, if you include the appendices, is well over 200 pages long and has dozens of pages uh, talking about the elements. And I commend it to your attention. Uh, this is actually, these are the issues that Robert Mueller is grappling with. Uh, but I will, uh, I made an effort in preparing to boil it down for you, particularly now that I only have three and a half minutes left. Uh, if an individual, any individual, including a president of the United States, because in our system, no person is above the law, if any individual attempts to interfere with, block, frustrate, or otherwise impede a criminal investigation with corrupt intent, uh, then that is obstruction of justice in a nutshell. The most critical question is, what is corrupt intent? And the, uh, the case law, uh, it's been ruled on by all of our uh, US uh, circuits. The case law is very interesting because it goes right to the heart uh, of, of the uh, 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 ethical and moral questions that lay just underneath the criminal law, just underneath all those uh, uh, lengthy provisions in uh, 18 United States Code are a set of moral questions. And obstruction of justice, uh, corrupt intent, uh, uh, is, is addressed by the courts as there's no cookie cutter, there is no simple test. It is evil or wrongful uh, intent in taking an action. So if a president fires an FBI director because the president genuinely believes that that FBI director is not doing a good job or uh, is not uh, competent or has not been following policies, no corrupt intent. But as we explain in our report, if a president fires an FBI director and engages in other misconduct, demanding loyalty, asking the FBI director to drop an investigation, particularly uh, if the president knows that the investigation is meritorious, uh, if the president should know, for example, that the thing being investigated is a lie to the FBI, you don't need a law degree to know, that's, that's a violation. Um, uh, that is a, a textbook case of corrupt intent because the things, uh, the things you look for in defining uh, corrupt intent are, uh, is the president trying to benefit himself, a family member, a friend, a former close associate? Is the president trying to hide something? And the, um, uh, uh, so there clearly ought to be an investigation, and there can be no question now that there is an investigation by Robert Mueller uh, of President Trump for obstruction of justice. It is not a laydown that obstruction occurred. And many people are saying, and again, not to shamelessly flog our report, we did work very hard on it. I think we were prescient in investing all those months uh, into producing this uh, big analysis. It's the, the only other place you'll find something like this in the world. There's only two other places. You'll find it on Robert Mueller's desk where his team has a running analysis for him of how the evidence lays out with the law, and you'll find it on the desk of the Trump defense team, Ty Cobb and the others, who are doing something similar, trying to fit this long body of cases and doctrine uh, into the facts here. Um, we did not lean, neither of those memos on the inside, having worked with Mueller, uh, having been a white collar defender, those memos, which are never intended to see the light of day, uh, don't lean one way or the other. They take a look at how the facts apply to the law and they argue both ways. Uh, you need to be very objective when you're doing this work. It is not a lay down case. A lot is gonna come down to which of Trump's many and shifting explanations he offers to Mueller when he talks to him. The special counsel will surely want to talk to Trump. And whether Mueller believes him, believes him despite uh, Trump having uh, perhaps the 
uh, lowest uh, 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 truth rating of any uh, president to occupy the Oval Office. Um, and, uh, and whether that, ec that explanation uh, is an innocent one uh, or a corrupt one, and whether the president is telling the truth. We don't know yet what judgment Mueller is gonna make. Part of the reason that we're cautious in our report is when you are, whether it's an indictment, and there are some legal issues with that, whether it is um, a referral to Congress of the kind that was made in the Watergate case relating to uh, obstruction, um, the, uh, uh, the bar is a very high bar when you're proceeding against the sitting president. So it is by no means a lay down as a hard question. We have tried to address it, to take it seriously. But the one final thing I'll say, and my colleagues are gonna talk more about this in particular, Jed, um, that the notion that there is a legal obstacle uh, that any uh, American case law impedes an obstruction prosecution of the president is sheer nonsense. There is no warrant for that in the Supreme Court cases. If anything, Morrison v. Olson and the other relevant cases go the opposite direction. There's no warrant for it in law. There's a long line of cases where, just like the, the president, uh, individuals are prosecuted for exercising otherwise uh, 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 legally authorized powers. So that uh, need not detain us for long, but we're forced to talk about it because the president and his lawyers have endorsed it. I hope I haven't, Jed, I hope I haven't unduly intruded on your presentation, but I'd be remiss if I did not add that coda. All right, well, I wanna go to Barb next and sort of talk from a prosecutor's perspective. Why is the obstruction of justice charge important? to prosecutors, and, and how do you approach such a case, and what are the challenges? Well, thanks very much, Kim. I'm uh... Uh, honored to be here today. Thank you to the American Constitution Society for the invitation, and very honored to be with, with Norm and Jed on this, uh, on this important topic. Um, as, a, as a former federal prosecutor, obstruction of justice is a charge we took very seriously. The criminal justice system depends on people to tell the truth. That's how the whole system works. When witnesses come into court, we put them under oath. When they testify before the grand jury, they are sworn to tell the truth. When an FBI agent questions uh, and interviews a witness, they're told that lying to investigators is a crime. And why is that? Because we want them to be on notice that it's so very important that they tell the truth and it's essential to the success of an investigation. And if that quest to tell the truth is to mean anything, then we have to hold people accountable when they lie so that we can deter people from lying to investigators, lying in court, lying before a grand jury in the future. And we do that by prosecuting people who lie or otherwise obstruct justice, who intimidate witnesses, who alter or destroy documents, or otherwise interfere with investigations. It is critical to uh, the integrity of our criminal justice system. And if conduct to uh, obstruct justice goes unchecked, that thwarts investigations. It makes investigations take longer. It makes it harder for investigators. And sometimes crimes remain hidden from the light of day because of the efforts to cover up those crimes. For so for those reasons, prosecutors consider obstruction of justice one of the very most important cases that we investigate. So the other question was, how does a, a case get built? How does a case arise? It always arises as part of some other larger investigation. And it usually begins because of some piece of information that's not consistent with other things that investigators know. A witness, is tells, a witness tells you something that doesn't add up. It doesn't match what other witnesses are telling you. It doesn't match what you know about documents. There is something that is causing some conflict in the investigation and some suspicion that someone is lying or otherwise destroying evidence. Um, as uh, Norm mentioned, there is this requirement of corrupt intent 
Uh, I tell my law students all crimes have two components, at least two components. There is the actus reus, the act, the criminal act, and there is the mens rea, which is the criminal intent. So the act is some act to obstruct or impede or interfere with an investigation, asking a witness to lie, asking someone to stop an investigation, destroying or altering documents might be the act. The harder part of all of these cases is the mens rea, proving the intent. And as Norm said, it is <coughs> proving that corrupt intent, that bad purpose. Um, and one of the things that a, a judge would instruct a jury about finding corrupt intent is to say something along the lines of, um, we can't read other people's minds. And so for that reason, we have to look at the totality of the circumstances to determine their intent. You should look at all of the things the person said, all of the things the person did, and all of the surrounding circumstances. And from that, you may use your common sense to draw reasonable inferences about the person's intent. And so those are the things that the Brookings Report, the Crew Report does uh, in this case, looking at all of those factors to try to glean what was a person's intent. And then, of course, Federal prosecutors also consider just because we can charge a crime, does that mean we should charge a crime? Using prosecutorial discretion is a very important part of what prosecutors do. And there is a list of factors that federal prosecutors use in the U.S. Attorney's Manual called the Principles of Federal Prosecution. And there's a whole list of factors that prosecutors are supposed to look at in deciding whether to bring charges. And among that list, are the person's culpability, the deterrent effect of prosecution, and the nature and seriousness of the offense. And when it comes to obstruction of justice, it scores very high on that last factor, the nature and seriousness of the offense. As I mentioned, it's one of the factors prosecutors consider, it's one of the crimes prosecutors consider the most serious because it so undermines our quest for the truth in the administration of justice. Just to give you an example, my former office handled a case recently against Volkswagen for cheating on emission standards, lying to the EPA, spewing 40 times the legal limits on its diesel vehicles, and lying about those, those cars by creating designing software that could defeat the emissions test. And so after an extensive investigation, Volkswagen ultimately pleaded guilty to a number of crimes and paid a $4.3 billion fine. Um, and in connection with that investigation, we learned that while investigating, there was a lawyer for Volkswagen who said to a team of employees, you know, we're going to uh, confess to regulators that we were involved in uh, some problems with our emissions. And we're going to do that tomorrow. A litigation hold is going to go in place tomorrow. Did you hear me? I said tomorrow. And many of the employees took that to mean that they should destroy documents that might be incriminating against themselves or the company. And they did. More than 40 employees destroyed documents as a result of that. Ultimately, Volkswagen was charged with and pled guilty to not only this $4.3 billion fraud, but we thought it was so important to also require them to plead guilty to obstruction of justice as a deterrent and to hold them accountable because we considered that crime to be so incredibly important. And so um, uh, you can see why for prosecutors, from a prosecutor's perspective, obstruction of justice is considered one of the most important crimes we prosecute because it is so essential to safeguarding the fair administration of justice. Okay, and I want to take it to, to Jed now, and we're going to get into a little later exactly what we know about the current uh, Mueller investigation, uh, but just before that, just in terms of uh, if you are for a special counsel, what options does he have if he were to find evidence of obstruction of justice, if he were to build a case, uh, what and what historic what historical precedent do we have that guides us to know what uh, Robert Mueller might do if that evidence is there? Great, thanks, Kim. Um, so a couple of, of thoughts here. One is I think the question that a lot of people are, are asking, oh, thank you. I was obstructing my own uh, participation. <laughs> uh, it's not going on. Got it, it's on now. Um, so uh, the big question I think a lot of people are asking is can Mueller bring an indictment against a sitting pres a president? And these issues are really unprecedented for presidents. I think the best arguments though are that uh, a prosecutor may not bring an indictment against a sitting, pres a sitting president. And there are a number of reasons why, but I think it's mainly functional rather than formal. Uh, it would be 
practically debilitating. If you had one rogue prosecutor and one rogue judge, uh, you could really take, uh, you'd have a sitting president sitting in a jail cell. Um, and that seems to be a problem. Uh, the framers, when they put together the Constitution, seem to have put it together with, with steps. You impeach and remove, and then you can indict. Now, it's functional, not formal, so you could have a scenario where you might have to take a you know, serial killer president to do something with him. That's not what we have here. Um, and and uh, in fact, um, one of the Supreme Court precedents that we have um, on Nixon versus Fitzgerald contemplates, uh, has this, a, a passage from a major uh, commentator in the 19th century, Joseph Story, which seems to indicate that you cannot indict a sitting president. But what's interesting in that passage is that he does contemplate, or it seems to open the door to, uh, indicting a president after leaving office for his uh, for crimes committed that are official acts. And that relates to a, a, a question we can get back to. Really what I think we would want to focus on is how Mueller could, is bringing indictments against others. And a, a historical example from, the, from Watergate was in those indictments as, they, as the case grows, uh, the a president can be noted as an unindicted co-conspirator. So that's not an indictment against the president, but it starts to lay out the facts and the potential criminal liability for the president without indicting the president himself. And there are also precedents, uh, like the Starr Report in, uh, in the Clinton impeachment, where the, uh, the investigator lays out the case, uh, where, where Starr, Starr had laid out the case in a report, and it's then used by Congress to draft um, articles of impeachment. Um, and then if we want to talk about Watergate in one more way, uh, Watergate was more driven by congressional committees and a joint select committee uh, in the end. And you know, as, as 1973 turned into 1974, um, it was more driven by Congress. Um, and so you could have a report that then leads to articles of impeachment um, being drafted. Um, I think there's also one more scenario that is increasingly important to discuss. Uh, and I think this is more urgent now given the tenor over the past few days. We need to talk about what happens if President Trump tries to fire Mueller. Uh, it turns out there are a series of regulations created by the DOJ that should stand in the way legally of the president trying to find, fire Mueller. Uh, those regulations basically say that only the attorney general, in this case the acting attorney general Rosenstein, could fire Mueller. But there are many uh, academics and lawyers who have a theory, not a, not a, a good theory, I, I would contend, of, of a total unity, unitary executive, which gives the president total control to do and undo regulations within the executive branch. There might be an argument uh, that they will put forward that the president, as the, lead, as the chief law enforcement officer, has the power to fire Mueller. That would lead to some litigation, uh, much like what we saw with the Consumer Finance Protection, the CFPB, over a dispute, right? It's a little bit ironic that the anti-fraud agency uh, of the federal government had a problem of identity theft. Um, uh, it depends, you know, each side was cl claiming the other side was engaging in identity theft. This would be a, a similar kind of question of who is the, who does Mueller have a, a job still? But as that would happen, um, what I would suggest is the other uh, avenue to discuss is whether Congress, whether a committee of Congress, either in the House or the Senate, could go ahead and hire Mueller, shift him from the executive branch into the legislative branch through a committee, whether Congress might create a joint select committee. But I also want to suggest another path, because it's hard to rely on Congress to, to, uh, to know what they would do, given that they haven't stepped forward to protect Mueller's job yet. What I want to suggest is that the states could step in. An, a, an attorney general of a state could hire Mueller to pursue state crimes. And the avenue that seems the most likely is for a New York Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman, to pursue state crimes like money laundering under New York state statutes or, uh, or, or um, trafficking in stolen goods or conspiracy to computer hack. Uh, the, there would be state jurisdiction, state criminal jurisdiction for which Mueller could be then pursuing state crimes. And keep in mind, a president does not have the power to pardon state crimes. The presidential uh, pardon power only relates to federal criminal liability. So it's important to talk about state criminal liability because of the pardon problem. It's also important to emphasize state criminal liability with respect to the risk of Mueller being fired as well. Okay, so let's take a look at, as we sort of dive deeper into exactly what uh, Robert Mueller and his team might be looking into, what constitutes obstruction of justice. Let's sort of start that with an eye on what we know so far, and with a caveat that whatever we know, uh, Robert Mueller and his team know a lot more. 
Uh, but so far, what we know about the facts that, as they're looking at them, there was an NBC News report yesterday uh, that the team is focusing on an 18-day period from the point uh, that they knew uh, that they were that the White House was informed that uh, F uh, General Michael Flynn might be uh, susceptible to Russian blackmail to the point that he was fired. I'm sure also uh, it was after that 18 days, but the conversation that President Trump had with James Comey uh, about uh, possibly letting uh, Michael Flynn go, uh, which happened I think a day or two later probably is also high on that list. What is it about that 18 day period or any other part in this uh, administration from the facts that we know publicly will be salient to this consideration as to whether an obstruction of justice charge could be brought. You can start, Nora. Uh, well, the, the 18 days uh, that are the principal but not the exclusive focus because in order to understand those 18 days to the extent the press report is accurate, uh, you need to both look uh, before them and beyond them. Uh, the 18 days um, rotate uh, around uh, uh, these questions of um, what the president knew, when he knew it, and uh, why he uh, fired uh, 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 Jim uh, Comey, ultimately. And the, 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 in a nutshell, uh, we know that Sally Yates came, that the acting attorney general, came to Don McGahn and indicated uh, that uh, the public statements that the White House was making based on Flynn's assertions were not accurate. Um, and we know uh, that um, uh, there was a direct question from the White House counsel, from Mr. McGahn, uh, about uh, whether Flynn had lied and was being investigated for that uh, by the FBI. And uh, that, uh, that she, that Yates uh, sidestepped that, as is appropriate, uh, uh, discussing about an open investigation. We know that there was a conversation between McGahn and the president about all this. Uh, and it, it matters because if it can be shown, and we now have a tweet, of course, the 18 days has been, uh, the period has been uh, uh, revived because the president tweeted that the reason he fired Flynn was because Flynn had lied uh, to him and had lied uh, to the FBI. So. If you can show, it would be a big uh, step forward, and I think this is the explanation for facts uh, like uh, uh, Hope Hicks uh, being interviewed for two days by Mueller's team for a very detailed TikTok. It's the pattern, the mosaic uh, that Barbara was talking about. If you can show that the president knew, likely knew, should have known at the time that he pressed Comey uh, to, can you see your way clear not to going after, uh, not to go after um, Flynn, um, uh, that uh, he was aware that Flynn had committed a federal crime by lying and was probably or certainly under investigation for it. Uh, boy, that gets you um, a long ways away from the innocent explanation of, gee, I don't like how Comey was managing the FBI, morale is lousy, to the corrupt intent of, uh, I better not uh, let them go after my friend, whether it's for personal reasons or because he's gonna roll over on me. Uh, the last thing I'll say in that regard, and, and I know uh, uh, Barbara and her prosecutors did this uh, a lot, Flynn got a very sweet deal from Bob Mueller. He's only getting that kind of a package given the nature of his offenses if he's gonna testify up the ladder on somebody else. I did this for 20 years. You don't get a deal like that when you've done the things that Flynn did unless you're, you're, you're willing to flip on somebody more senior. And, um, and so the fact that we now have Flynn in the mix suggests that he may have something to say 
about this uh, question of corrupt intent and obstruction during the key window, like Trump uh, telling him to lie or him telling Trump he had lied to the FBI agents. I don't know if either of those are the case, but those are the kinds of things that might excite a prosecutor. Barb? Well, I'll agree with, with Norm that uh, Robert Mueller now has a potential treasure trove in, in Michael Flynn uh, because he knows about all the conversations, he knows what was said, and Robert Mueller would not have given him that deal, a plea to false statements with a advisory guideline range of zero to six months, likelihood of serving only probation, unless he knew he had valuable information um, in exchange for that. And you don't give that deal until you sit down and, and proffer with the attorney um, and debrief with the defendant to understand what it is they have to offer. So he likely has a lot of information. And what are those questions? I, I agree with Kim that those 18 days are probably really critically important because we have at the end of that period the request from President Trump to Jim Comey, can't you see your way clear to letting this go? Or I hope you could see your way clear to letting this go. So what did he know at that time? As we said, that, that corrupt intent, that mens rea is so important. And so what did he know at that time? Did he know that uh, Flynn had lied to the FBI at that moment because he already had? Did Trump know that? And if he did, that means he knew that he was asking Comey to let a crime go when he was asking him to let this thing go against uh, Flynn. Did he further know about the underlying conversations with the Russian ambassador that was the basis of those false statements? And did he further know who else might be implicated in an investigation about those statements? We see in the statement of offense filed along with the documents that there were at least two high level, one very high level, very senior member of the tra Trump transition team who was in communication with Michael Flynn at the time he was having those conversations with the Russian ambassador. Did Trump know that? Um, and finally, what did he know about the big picture of the investigation? Did he, was he concerned not only about the false statements, not only about the bigger picture of the conversations with the Russian ambassador, but is there more to the story? Is there more interference between Russians and the election that Trump is trying to cover up? And if, as that circle expands, I think the evidence of corrupt intent becomes greater because it suggests not just let this guy go because he's a good guy, it is I am concerned about greater exposure for members on my team or possibly even the president himself. And so I think that is why those 18 days are really critically important about what information did, did Trump have, what did he know, and talking to all of these, those people who are in the area at the time are likely to be able to paint that picture for Robert Mueller and his team. Chad? Great. Um, I have one point about Flynn, and then I want to shift to another grounds, I think, actually think of very strong grounds for obstruction of justice um, after, after a note about Flynn. First, I think it's quite possible that the reason why there's all of this uh, speculation about Mueller investigating these 18 days, because Flynn may have already told Mueller that I was told to lie. But Mueller also knows that Flynn is not the most credible witness he's ever going to have. One, he's already pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. The defense counsel will use that first and foremost to say that we, he's already, he's already, he's already a, a felon in terms of lying. Uh, and then they will also be able to introduce the deal. They will be able to frame the deal to the, to the jury uh, to uh, at least uh, suggest very clearly that he may have a, a motive to lie now. Um, to, to set up this case for Mueller. So it's very important for Mueller to substantiate in some other way, though the witnesses he's now talking to have to be quite worried about whether they might be lying. So, so you can't only rely on Flynn, but, and Mueller needs to find someone else, but he's got a lot of leverage, both for federal and, as I said before, for state criminal liability to get someone else to confirm if it's in fact true. But the thing I want to emphasize is it's actually, there's already a strong obstruction case already based upon what Trump has already said in public. So just look at this timeline. So uh, Trump decides that he's going to fire Comey. And he and Stephen Miller, uh, I can't wait to see the Miller versus Mueller showdown at some point, <laughs> but Stephen Miller and Trump sit down and write a letter. This letter is so problematic that Don McGahn, the White House counsel, says you cannot show, that, le that letter cannot see the light of day. Now there's speculation, it was described in the New York Times as a screed, but I think there's a reasonable speculation or some implication that it may have talked about the Russian investigation as a reason why he's firing Comey. There is a draft of that letter somewhere in someone's, uh, in, in, uh, as a, in a database somewhere, 
And Mueller will have a, be able to see that letter and if it, in fact, laid out the Trump and the Russia investigation as a reason to fire. Um, keep in mind that many other people participated in that letter. Jared Kushner allegedly participated. Um, Vice President Pence allegedly heard that letter. They are also potentially implicated in conspiracy to obstruct justice or aiding and abetting to obstruct justice. Um, so, the, so there are more people who might be facing liability who will, might tell the story to, to um, save themselves from that liability. Then, a day after uh, C Trump fires Comey on May 9th, on May 10th, in the Oval Office, Trump says to Kislyak and Lavrov, two Russian officials, he says, I just fired the head of the FBI. He was crazy, a real nut job. I faced great pressure because of Russia. That's taken off. Then the next day, as if that wasn't enough, Trump goes on, Lest with, uh, on TV with Lester Holt on NBC and tells the country, um, he says, and in fact, when I decided to do it, meaning fire Comey, I said to myself, I said, you know, this Russia thing with Trump and Russia is a made up story. It's an excuse by the Democrats for having lost an election that they should have won. Okay, so you could interpret both of those statements immediately after firing Comey as demonstration of a mens rea, of a corrupt, of, of corrupt intent or uh, as under the, the other statutes that relate to obstruction, an improper purpose to shut down the Russia investigation. Add to that the context of what Comey has described before he was fired. Add to that the, the tweet that we, just, we talked about, I fired Flynn because he lied to the FBI, lied to uh, Pence and the FBI, um, and it establishes more to the story, but basically Trump has made the hardest part of the case, establishing mens rea and corrupt intent, and he's made that case already much easier by what he said almost contemporaneously with the firing. Now, I have a question. There's a lot uh, of, of talk throughout this investigation about collusion, which uh, we know in itself is not uh, a crime, but there are other crimes. Conspiracy, I guess, would be the closest thing to that and, and other things. But if that's the basis of this investigation and there is no clear evidence of an underlying crime, can, you, can a prosecutor still bring an obstruction of justice crime by itself? Yeah, I can start on that one. So the answer is yes. Um, obstruction of justice is a crime in and of itself. If you seek to impede uh, a proceeding, and there doesn't even have to be a pending proceeding as long as a proceeding is foreseeable in the future. If you have the actus reus and the mens rea, yes, you can. Now, you might say why. Well, one is the deterrence, as we talked about before. But oftentimes, if you bring the obstruction case, it can lead to uh, bringing the underlying case. We had an example in, in my district. We had a case involving a hate crime where a group of men uh, set a fire to the home of a family, an African-American family who had moved into a white neighborhood. Uh, they were suspected of committing this crime, but we couldn't make out the crime. Uh, but we, we knew that they were providing inconsistent stories, conflicting stories, and one who was clearly lying. So he was charged with obstruction of justice and ultimately were able to flip him, get him to cooperate, to provide additional evidence that was able to prove the underlying case. So not only can it be charged alone, but frequently it can be used as a tool to reach the underlying criminal conduct. And, and what about uh, expressions of, well, I'm gonna ask two questions and have anybody who wants to, to join in. Uh, one is can otherwise legal conduct, conduct that the, would be within the power of the president or anyone in the White House to do, rise to the level of obstruction of justice if it has those two elements that we've uh, been talking about? And what kinds of uh, expressions uh, could be used to do it, for example, uh, as, as we pointed out, it, James Comey said that the president told him that he hopes that he sees it clear to let Flynn go. Is an expression of hope enough uh, to be considered uh, evidence of obstruction of, 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 of justice? Uh, an expression of hope is sufficient. And in fact, the issue has frequently been litigated because when um, uh, defendants are... Um, uh, doing obstruction talk, they often try to be kind of elusive. So there, are, specifically, there are cases we talk about them in our paper where um, saying, "Gee, I, I hope those televisions fall off the truck." That kind of language is sufficient where the plain meaning is obstructive. Um, and then, otherwise legal conduct. There's a long. Uh, list of cases across the country, the matter has been litigated. This argument, gee, because it's legal, 
um, uh, if I'm a sheriff and I otherwise have the authority uh, to unquestioned authority to arrest people or to run a sting operation, or if I, if I uh, Norm Eisen, as attorney, as an attorney, otherwise have the authority to issue a subpoena uh, to somebody in a pending matter. Uh, but if I do it with a corrupt intent, I'm thinking of the Baca case in California, uh, where the sheriff's office was involved and they tried to use their powers in order to intimidate uh, an investigation of corruption, corrupt intent. So the, the notion, this is a totally made up, it's abhorrent to American law, and it's totally made up, uh, literally on the fly, and it's nonsensical, the notion that uh, the exercise of, of uh, lawful powers for an improper purpose uh, cannot be uh, corrupt and therefore obstructive. So you sound like you're saying that the power that the person has is, is a crucial element to this. I mean, in the case of a sheriff or even an attorney and certainly the president. In, it has been in, abuse of that power has been in case after case after case. Now, that is not to say, I should say, that is, and this goes to Jed, so we're not just all agreeing with each other. That is not to say that, um, that it's a uh, easy case. Whenever there's, and this I think is why Flynn may be so important to making the obstruction case, because it's, uh, you know, Mueller does look at, the, does look at this uh, as a man who's tried many a case to a jury. And you ask yourself, how can I sell uh, this? Okay, I think something wrong happened here. How can I persuade a jury of that beyond a reasonable doubt? It is much easier to uh, explain uh, why, um, if the facts lay out this way, you tell somebody to lie about uh, the instructions that were given uh, to talk to a foreign ambassador or not because it's embarrassing. And then in order to protect that person, you try to get an investigation dropped. That putting a human face on it is, is an easier thing to explain to a jury. It's easier to get a conviction than a more abstract considerations of the Russia investigation, particularly if it may turn out that that complex, uh, foreign, somewhat nebulous in the president's foreign policy powers, uh, uh, ultimately involves uh, a lack of collusion, a lack of uh, any real uh, proof that there was a causal relationship between Russia and the election outcome. So um, the, 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 the helping a friend in order to spare yourself embarrassment is an easier, more human case to make to a jury. But this is not easy, and, uh, and Mueller is undoubtedly wrestling with it, and there's no guarantee he's going to say, even if there's good evidence, there's no guarantee it's going to pass the prosecutorial sniff test, particularly with uh, Mueller's very principled uh, this would be true at any time. I had a defendant who I cut a plea deal for, a cooperation deal for with uh, his office when he was U.S. Attorney in San Francisco. It was a tough, long negotiation. Uh, 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 but when it's a sitting president, you got to admit it, it's a higher bar. Jed, do you have something else? Sure. I mean, I, th I think this conversation touches on the way the debate about uh, the, this unitary executive argument has shifted in the last week. So because so much of the question relates to the firing of Comey and potentially the firing of Mueller, uh, the debate among some um, defenders of presidential power or maybe defenders of Trump, Trump's own lawyer, have said that a president can never obstruct justice, right? And that argument, they've, they've, they've made this forceful argument about, you know, a little bit like when Nixon said, um, if the president does it, that means it's not illegal. Um, fortunately, I think those lawyers have all backtracked from that um, stretch of an argument, but they, what they've backtracked to is a problematic argument. So um, this is Dershowitz's fallback position. I just want to summarize it here, draw from what he said. He said, under our constitutional system of separation of powers, the president cannot be charged with a crime for merely exercising his authority under Article 2. Article 2 of the Constitution is the executive branch part of the Constitution. This authority includes firing the director of the FBI for whatever reason, uh, or no reason. And he goes on to say, so until and unless there is proof that Trump has committed an independent criminal act, something else other than firing, beyond acts that were within his constitutional prerogative, it would be unconstitutional to charge him with obstruction of justice. The argument is that because the Constitution gives the president a, a, uh, an enumerated power, 
then that president has limitless discretion. However he wants or she wants to use that power, uh, corruptly or not corruptly, they can use that power. You need some other crime. And there was an exchange that I think highlights the problem with this argument. So later, one, another academic, Andy Graywall, um, was engaged in a debate about this, um, about this argument. And someone uh, challenged him and said, I understand your theory and legal analysis, but does your analysis stand true every time an official act is an element of the crime? What about if it's a part of a bribe? And he responds, the acceptance of a bribe is not an official act, so, could, it couldn't, uh, so that could be criminalized. He wants to separate firing or pardoning from the bribe. And then the, uh, this other commentator said, well, yes, but if the bribe is conveyed by an official act, what then? And he said, you don't have to pay a bribe to commit bribery. It's the agreement to do so. so and without a side agreement, I don't see how firing someone could even be considered a payment of a bribe. Let me be specific about why this opens the door to why this argument is flawed. And I can give you a hypo or a thought experiment. Imagine um, some billionaire said, you know, uh, said to the, uh, sent a coded message to the president. And that message to the president is, um, if you pardon X or if you fire X and then hire my cousin, nominate my cousin, um, I will send you uh, uh, through Bitcoin or something a um, million dollars. And there is no response by the president and of any, any other message back. The only thing the president does is he pardons the cousin or he fires an official or fires an official and then nominates the cousin. The only thing that the president has done is the official duty under Article 2. The, the, he's ex either exercised the, the, his power to pardon or he's exercised the power to fire and or nominate. In this model, right, that you have to have some other act. Well, if you needed some other act, then this would be a giant loophole for presidents to simply say, as long as you send me a message, I will just do the firing or pardoning or nominating, and then at least you can send a million, spend a million dollars of independent advertising for my reelection campaign. And there would be no legal ramification for that behavior, right? Although you know, maybe impeachment would be available, but you still would have 34 senators who could block it. And, and so you would really have a problem with that. Can, that result cannot be right. So the point is that firing Comey, whether it was done for a promise of a million dollars or uh, as a bribe or done for obstruction of justice, the act of using an official constitutional power can be both the actus reus, it can be the, if, if, it can be the only act that demonstrates an actual act by the president under, the, under criminal law, and it can be uh, reflective evidence of mens rea, the corrupt intent. Um, and so because of that, that hypothetical, um, I think that demonstrates that, uh, that an official act by a president, even if it's constitutionally delegated to the president, could still be the execution of some felony. So say hypothetically that Robert Mueller and his team uh, have evidence that they believe supports a charge of corruption of justice, uh, of, of obstruction of justice against the president or vice president. What then? Can he, can he prosecute them? Well, I've said before that, you, um, that he would, uh, my view, and I think this um, is bolstered by historical evidence, is that Mueller cannot bring an indictment against a sitting president. But he could bring in, those, so those functional problems do not uh, obtain, do not pertain to a vice president, right? So other officials b besides the president could, uh, could face indictments in the same way that we've seen indictments of, 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 Papado of, of Manafort and Papadopoulos and Flynn. Um, we could see that on all other cases. I still think the bottom line is that the right way to proceed historically based upon the design of the Constitution is, is to proceed by impeachment and removal um, and then, and you know, and then there might be indictments. There might not be. I'd also say here that it, you know, it, given how impeachment and removal go, it may be perfectly reasonable to, for for Trump to have his own Gerald Ford. In the same way that uh, that Ford pardoned Nixon, I think history has been kinder to Ford's decision to pardon uh, Nixon than it, than than there was at the time, where it was more controversial. Um, I don't think we need to chant "lock him up." right in this room. I don't think that has to be the right resolution. I think we need justice and accountability um, and impeachment can bring that out, but we don't necessarily need prosecution. I'll jump in here briefly, but I know Norm wants to answer this question because his paper does a very nice job of laying out the options on this. But I think as a practical matter, I agree with Jed. Um, Robert Mueller 
is required under the special counsel regulation to comply with all Department of Justice policies. And the Department of Justice itself, through its Office of Legal Counsel, gave an opinion during the Watergate era that a sitting president cannot be indicted. Instead, the remedy is impeachment. So I would suspect that as a practical matter, Robert Mueller would follow that guidance of the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel and proceed in that way, providing a report to the House Judiciary Committee uh, laying out the case for them to decide whether they want to proceed by impeachment or not. Well, we have indeed uh, tackled this, uh, this question, and, but I see that the Senator is here, so I'm simply going to point you, and I can't talk this fast anyhow, but I am going to point you to pages 90 through 90, good Lord, we took a lot of pages to talk about this, pages 90 through uh, 101, in which we point out that the OLC opinion is not binding, the flaws in the reasoning of the OLC opinion, the views of three uh, special counsel or special prosecutors that they can prosecute a president, and the deep principled basis to believe that such prosecutions are appropriate. I'm going to welcome up Kara, uh, Kara Stein from ACS to introduce the center. Thanks, Kim. Good afternoon. My name is Kara Stein, and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Program at the American Constitution Society. It is my great honor to introduce a good friend to ACS and a champion to all those who care about the health of our democracy, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse served as Rhode Island's United States Attorney and Attorney General of Rhode Island before being elected to the United States Senate in 2006. He is a leading advocate for protecting access to justice and a stalwart critic of the influence of money on our politics. His recent book, Captured, The Corporate Infiltration of American Democracy, exposes the extent to which our government is now beholden to corporate interests. And most relevant to our discussion today, he is the ranking member on the Senate Judiciary Committee's on, Subcommittee on Crime and Terrorism, which has been central to the investigation of Russian interference in the 2016 election. Please join me in welcoming Senator Whitehouse. Thank you for inviting me. It's a uh, pleasure to be here, and I'm a great admirer of ACS and all the wonderful work you do. You've got a superb panel here, so I don't want to take too long, but I would like to make uh, three points. Uh, the first is that I am uh, of the quite firm view that the uh, presidency does not confer upon its occupant immunity from prosecution. The best case that can be made, because the Constitution specifically provides that the target of an impeachment can be indicted and prosecuted, indeed instructs that that is the case. So uh, as one commentator pointed out, the question is not whether uh, but when, um, given just the practice of investigation, grand jury work, and so forth, the logical best argument against that is that the president has a right of some kind to have a court adjudicate whether or not the trial should proceed once an indictment has been rendered. Otherwise, you get into a very bizarre never-never land in which you have grand jury activity protected by Rule 6E. You have no real means for getting the information from that process to the court or to the Congress. The ordinary way you do that is by laying out a very comprehensive indictment that the grand jury then votes on, and that's how it becomes public. And that would be the moment when I think uh, the Congress would have something to consider in terms of impeachment, and you may want to have a situation in which the special counsel and the Congress work together to make sure that one isn't bumping into the other. Um, but it seems to me a real stretch that uh, immunity from criminal prosecution is conferred upon uh, the president. Um, if he were to murder somebody, it would seem to me that the course of justice would require that uh, he be charged and uh, the charges pursued under 
proper course of law. And to take that away when we have a vice president who has virtually no other task other than to be ready to take over the duties of the presidency, why would you put that person in if there was not uh, that liability of the president? So that's the first point. I think it's a stretch. The second point is that I think we have to be alert to a very conspicuous campaign being fired up through the right-wing media that is moving from the farthest extremes more towards the center to try to deprecate uh, Bob Mueller, to try to deprecate the notion that the president can commit obstruction of justice, to try to deprecate the notion that if an indictment is reached, he should be held uh, accountable and so forth. I think we have to be very, very watchful about this because it has all of the hallmarks of propaganda and manipulation as opposed to genuine expression of opinion. And when you line it up against some of the other traditional benchmarks and referees that are deprecated and attacked whenever they blow the whistle on the Trump administration, you come to a pattern of this administration essentially trying to get its own way even when the refs blow a whistle on it by saying that the ref is tainted. And taken to its logical conclusion, that ends checks and balances. And that ends the important role of the fourth estate. And that turns a limited democracy with checks and balances into an authoritarian <coughs> regime in which the uh, administration becomes its own propaganda outlet. And we don't want to go down that road. The third point that I'd like to make, and my final one, veers a little bit away from obstruction of justice and steps back to the Russia-Trump investigation uh, itself. Um, the focus of the Senate in that investigation ought to be among other things, and perhaps first among other things, on protecting our democracy from further Russian political interference. And the testimony has been unanimous and unquestioned that the Russians are going to continue to do this stuff. It is what they do. We have not had a witness before any of our Senate committees say, nope, that was a one-off. Uh, we've got them on the run now. It's not going to happen again. Every single witness has said, nope, they're coming back. You can bet on it. They'll be back in 18. They'll be back in 20. They're not going anywhere. They don't even mind very much being caught because it shows them being players and meddlers. They don't want to have a hard fingerprint, perhaps, on things. But they love the notion uh, around the world that they are meddling with America and disrupting uh, our operations. So uh, I think we have a very clear threat in front of us. We also have very clear advice. And the very clear advice is that Putin's interference in our democracy, or anybody else's for that matter, whether it's the Grand Ayatollah from Iran, or whether it's from China, or whether it's from the Saudis, or whomever, that the vector for that improper interference is, tr is uh, corruption, and the absence of transparency, opacity. And we, as Americans, and we, as Democrats, have very important equities in trying to solve the problem, particularly of opacity. Because where you don't know who's behind campaign funding, you have no way to know whether it's Vladimir Putin. If you want to hold off foreign influence in our elections, you have to make sure that our elections are transparent. And that is another virtually unanimously agreed point from all of our witnesses. And that applies not only specifically to campaign finance machinations that allow money to turn into dark money, to turn into improper and perhaps foreign influence. It also refers to shell corporations and the entire apparatus of anonymity 
that supports Putin and his kleptocrats by allowing them to cash their money, C-A-C-H-E, their money, over here in rule of law territories and um, find the safety and security of rule of law for their ill-gotten gains. But it also allows them to launder malevolent and malicious activities through one, two, three, you can stack shell corporations and hide the hand of Vladimir Putin behind things that look potentially benign. So two very important policy goals that are clearly, clearly, clearly established in our hearings are to clean up dark money in our elections and to clean up dark shell and shelf corporations in our country. And those are things that would be really good for us as well. And they put the other party into a significant pickle because the very same transparency that will reveal the fact that it's Vladimir Putin messing in our elections will reveal how the Koch brothers mess in our elections, will reveal how the Mercers mess in our elections, will reveal how ExxonMobil messes in our elections. It would essentially blow up Donors Trust, which is an organization that exists for the sole purpose of laundering the identity of big donors who want to influence politics and policy. And were the shoe on the other foot, you can bet that this would be an absolute Republican priority, where they could line up national security, the patriotic interest we have in free and fair elections, and cleaning up a mess that is of enormous benefit to the Democratic Party. They would be beating us about the head and shoulders with this issue every single day. And we need to organize to make sure that we can do this right because it is the acme of weakness to be unable to take advantage of a moment like this where the interests of our party and our democracy and our country are all exactly aligned. So I urge upon all of you that you think about this issue in those terms as well as in the specific terms of whether the president has obstructed justice. And with that, I conclude my remarks. I don't know if you want. Yeah, I have a question for Go you ahead. while you're here. I mean, our, <laughs> sorry, uh, occupational <coughs> hazard. Um, I may we've, take a water. Sure. We've been talking about obstruction of justice in the context of the special counsel's yes. investigation. Yes. But what if uh, your committee or other congressional committees that are looking into uh, Russian interference find evidence of obstruction of justice? What can you do? Well, probably the most important thing would be to either make it public so that it became so that it came to the attention of the special counsel or to communicate it to special counsel uh, privately so that they could have a chance to have a voice in us whether we should reveal or not reveal something that we know. Um, one of the things that we don't know and should not know is who special counsel is running right now as a cooperator. We did not know about Papadopoulos' cooperation until uh, his plea agreement was revealed. Um, although the plea agreement with Mike Flynn puts a pretty bright flashing hazard light on him for all the uh, Trump team to stay away from, um, it is possible that he had assembled uh, information on his own uh, early on without a cooperation agreement just to have material to work with. He may have recorded calls. He may have who knows what. And there may be others out there who are presently unknown to the Trump organization who are gathering information as cooperating witnesses. And the last thing we would want to do in something that came up in the Senate would be to prejudice anything that was ongoing. So prior notice to special counsel of what we plan to do I think would be a very appropriate courtesy. And then we could make the decision if we should go forward anyway because ultimately the Senate has just as much right to go forward to do whatever it wants, even if it inconveniences special counsel, but we should at least know. You don't want to inadvertently interfere with that investigation 
Uh, but if our equities and our priorities are such that even if it's an inconvenience to special counsel, the Senate should go ahead, that's the decision we're entitled to make. And go ahead and do what? What could you do? Have public hearings that built the record so that, um, depending on how far it went, you could have um, both public awareness of what was going on, and then potentially it adds to the battery of evidence that could be considered were the House to take up an impeachment resolution. Okay. Have we got time to ask you one more? Sure. Uh, I always invite Mara people. Will blow the whistle when I have to go. Uh, I always in charge of my time. I, I always invite people to uh, to reach out on Twitter when we have an event, and of course, this event will be broadcast on C-SPAN and on the ACS website uh, or rebroadcast. So I'll ask on behalf of some of my Twitter followers who want to know uh, what are, what is the most effective thing given the current state of events uh, that, e that you so eloquently described, what's the most effective thing that individual citizens and people out there uh, in the US can do, and how effective is it, as I often tweet them to do, uh, of both parties, by the way, because as you know, I do all this work together with Richard Painter, yeah. who's a card-carrying conservative Republican, many, many uh, Republicans who are agitated about this. So irrespective of party, what's the most effective thing or things that folks out there in the world can do, Senator? I think uh, to agitate for campaign finance disclosure, which is ordinarily a bipartisan issue and was for years a bipartisan issue, and to agitate for uh, incorporation transparency. Um, the fact of the matter is that the Republicans were far quicker off the mark after Citizens United was decided than we were. We had a long period of introspection and anxiety about whether to uh, take advantage of what Citizens United provided. The fossil fuel industry didn't have any such scruples. I think they asked for and expected that decision and were ready to go at the gun like a sprinter as soon as they had it in their hands. And it did not take them long to figure out the various machinations through which they could take the unlimited money that they can spend in our elections and make it unlimited dark money so that nobody could see their fingerprints on it. And of course, worse than that, if you want to just do a quick sidebar on the Citizens United decision, it's not the unlimited money that's the worst. It's not even the unlimited money gone dark so that you don't know who's behind it that's the worst. What's the worst is the promises and threats that the ability to spend unlimited dark money enables. Because you will never see any sign of those promises or threats. You may see the dark money spent, you just won't know who's behind it. You see the unlimited money spent if somebody was disclosing, which they ordinarily don't but you'll never see that third level. And that's really where the bulk of the iceberg is politically on that issue. The unlimited money and the dark money are the tip of the iceberg that you see, but the threat and power and promise and manipulation that that all enables in politics, that's the big bulk down under the iceberg. And for the Democratic Party to follow the Republican Party in the short run is probably a political necessity, but we really ought to clean this mess up because democracy is not well served by unlimited dark money and the threats and promises that it enables. It just is not. And I think uh, the coincidence between Citizens United and the rise of the ire that led to Donald Trump is not just a coincidence of time. We've got to clean up this mess. It will make a huge difference in our politics. So militate like hell and agitate like hell on campaign transparency and shell corporation transparency. All right, well, this was the point where we were gonna open up uh, the session for questions if you have them. If there is a uh, microphone right here and if uh, Senator Whitehouse could stay for a few more minutes for that, that would be great. Laura gives me the hook, until then I'm good. <laughs> uh, yes, you, ha you mentioned the uh, corporate transparency. Where do we stand on dealing with the uh, individual states which maintain that secrecy? This is not so much a federal problem because in, under federal law, we have pretty much full disclosure. 
Um, it's a federal problem in the sense that we have not bothered to require states to comply with federal priorities in this area. And I think it is a federal priority that the United States of America not become a giant Cayman Islands that is the home for kleptocrats, criminals, and people who are up to no good from around the world. I think there's even a national security component to not being known as that when we have for generations, you know, shown ourselves to be the city on the hill, some city on a hill if you're where all the dark money goes. So we have to clean this up, I think, for a whole lot of reasons. The states are tough. I mean, um, you know, Nevada funds teachers through this. They kind of baked it in by building that constituency. Uh, Delaware has an entire industry uh, of this. I forget which of the Dakotas, North or South Dakota, is so heavily involved, one, or the, one, one of the two. And they drive the Secretary of State's Association to oppose this. And the lawyers that enable this, who frankly should be ashamed of themselves, uh, drive the American Bar Association, believe it or not, to oppose us on this. And it's uh, unerring taste for supporting all things evil drives the US so-called Chamber of Commerce uh, to oppose us on this. So we have some fairly big adversaries, but I don't think there's much merit to the opposition. I think it's mostly um, representing the small faction of their membership that traffics in this business and makes money off this business. I suspect the yacht brokers would have an objection um, and some high-end realtors might have an objection, but their objections should not stand against the public interest and the national interest in us not being a haven for international crime and kleptocracy. You have a question? Yes. Good law enforcement support, by the way, on this, which is a and counter. And if you could come up to the microphone to ask which your is question, helpful. just so that we can get it uh, for posterity on our recording. Thanks. So we've been hearing news reports of the president potentially firing Mueller. What do you think the Senate's response is to that? Um, at the moment, I think there would be intense blowback. Uh, if he made an effort to fire uh, Bob Mueller. It's also not easy to do. Um, the danger would be a slow-mo effort where you either fired or convinced Sessions to resign, and then you uh, tried to get an attorney general in place who would not be recused from the investigation in the scope that Bob Mueller has defined it, but would nevertheless be a partisan loyalist and would say, I'm here now, I'm not recused. With the Attorney General not recused, we no longer need special counsel. Thank you, Bob, for your service. We are bringing uh, the career people together and we're going to keep this going and see if there's a case to be made and we're going to do our duty and they would say all the right things um, and then you know little by little people would be let go or transferred out or things would be stalled or things would be leaked and you know you could see the investigation damaged that way so short of actually firing Mueller uh, there are plenty of ways to try to manipulate and mess with all of this my worry is less that that will happen now, and when I think it will still blow up in our face, then that six months from now, after the right-wing media operation has propagandized against Mueller consistently for a long, 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 long time, has propagandized against the FBI for a long, 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 long time, has begun to build a wave of partisan tribal signaling that at some point the president then feels, okay, I feel imperiled enough and I feel I've got enough support out there now that we've whipped everybody up that I can then make that decision. And then that's the question is how many of our uh, Republican colleagues will at that point say, okay, that's the bridge too far. So that's an unknown. But right, if he were to do it now, I think it would blow up in his face catastrophically. 
And I'll just add on that, that uh, uh, ACS and crew have jointly, as part of our presidential investigation project, just issued a report explaining why the legalities make it, not just the political consequences, but the legalities make it not so easy uh, for Trump to oust Mueller. We provided uh, a copy for you, and among other things, there are if, if Trump were to try it uh, in an illegal way, there would be um, uh, judicial remedies that would lie against him. So uh, he's got himself, uh, he, he made his situation infinitely worse by uh, firing Jim Comey in a possibly obstructive fashion. It's a very messy, messy thing to do. And what he would have to think about would be whether his firing of Mueller, or I should be more specific, his efforts to fire his way through intermediaries to try to get to Mueller would not itself be obstruction of justice. And given how incontinent he has been with his tweets and is likely to continue to be with his tweets, he's building actually a pretty good record. I mean, there are tweets of his that if a grand jury or jury believed that the requisite intent behind them was present <laughs> are themselves obstruction of justice. If his campaign to attack and criticize the credibility of Jim Comey was believed to be targeted at the grand jurors so that they would not believe the testimony of Jim Comey when he came into the grand jury, that would be an effort to interfere with the grand jury. That under the obstruction statutes is quite plain. So intent becomes really key, and that's where Flynn's testimony and others, in terms of elucidating things that he said and all of that becomes very, very um, filled with uh, hazard and uh, potential. The same could apply also to pardons. Uh, depending on yep. particularly self-pardons. Yep. Uh, I don't think you can self-pardon, pardon, but if you pardon a family member or if you, particularly if you pardon somebody who appears that they might be cooperating, I think the pardon is probably good. But that doesn't mean that the act itself isn't an act of obstruction of justice. And so when you get into these things, you then begin to create, now just imagine if this starts to look really bad and you are the White House counsel or you're in the White House counsel's office, and it begins to look to you like you are being asked to commit an act that you know to be intended to obstruct the grand jury, to be intended to obstruct the investigation. You now have a very interesting conversation with your own lawyer about the aiding and abetting statute and about the doctrine of conspiracy. And that begins to cause enormous stress uh, within an organization. So there's a point where this obstruction thing becomes the cloud that basically grinds the White House operation to a halt. So far it appears to me that he's more or less stayed inside that boundary. I don't have the information to know otherwise, but one can easily hypothesize a situation in which it is clear because of what they know inside the White House to members of the administration that this is, in fact, an effort to obstruct justice, is, in fact, an effort to reach into the grand jury and influence what they are doing, is, in fact, an effort to stop or obstruct the Mueller investigation, whatever it is, and that, therefore, their own continued cooperation, support, and participation in it now potentially imperils them. Do you have any other questions? Very interesting. All right, well, I thank you all for what you are doing. This is an important thing to attend to. And in the context both of fixing the dark money and shell corporations problems that bedevil our democracy and being prepared to respond to the effort to attack all the referees, including the rule of law and those who seek to enforce it, these conversations are vital. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. And we have just a couple minutes left if you had any more questions of our panelists uh, about obstruction of justice. Well, if not, if you could join me in giving a round of applause and, and thanking our panelists for this discussion. <laughs>